Well, here we all are again. It's nice to see everyone. Once again, we're here for an omnibus lecture, and this one a very exciting and timely one because, of course, we have a political columnist here, and none of us have seen very many political commercials or signs around town these days. Uh, so it, it will be really a, um, a welcome change from the common. Tonight, of course, we have Eugene Robinson here, and the, the lecture is sponsored in part by the Journal Gazette, which runs Mr. Robinson's column on a regular basis. Uh, so we're, we're pleased that we were able to partner with them. Uh, our, uh, our media sponsors are Wayne TV, News Channel 15, and uh, Northeast Indiana Public Radio, so we want to thank them as well. And of course, as always, we want to express our deepest gratitude to the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation, which has been our loyal supporter since day one, pardon me, lecture one of the Omnibus Lecture Series. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. Let me remind you for just a minute, although I see so many familiar faces that I know you need no reminding of the format uh, of, of the lecture. Of course, there's, there's the lecture, uh, but afterwards there'll be a question and answer session. Please wait to ask questions until one of our ushers comes to you with a microphone because everyone would like to hear the question as well as the answer, and, and the mic really helps. Um, of course, you know, the acoustics are perfect in this room, so you could do it without a microphone, but it doesn't work that well. Tonight, to introduce our lecturer, um, we have a representative of the Journal Gazette, in fact, a distinguished representative of the Journal Gazette, Tracy Warner, who is the editorial page editor, which, of course, means he runs the editorial page. A distinguished uh, person in his own right and a distinguished journalist. We're pleased to welcome Tracy Warner to the stage. We were um, very happy to get Eugene Robinson's column for the Journal Gazette. One great thing about the newspaper, you only have to read one story at a time, and, and you can choose what music you listen to or, or watch TV. So We're very happy to have Eugene Robinson's column in the Journal Gazette. Uh, he writes two columns a week for the Washington Post, and, and in this era of multimedia does some other things too that he'll probably talk to you about. Um, he's been with the Post for 28 years. He started there as a city hall reporter, uh, later became the city editor. He was a uh, bureau chief for South America and then also for London. He was the Post's foreign editor and then more recently he was the editor of the style section and that was before he started his column about three years ago. Prior to working to the Washington Post, he worked for the San Francisco Chronicle for five years and that was after graduating from the University of Michigan. You may also see Eugene on MSNBC, where he appears frequently as a political analyst. He's also written two books. The most recent is Last Dance in Havana. In addition to these columns uh, that are always well written, always have a lot of insight, Eugene Robinson is consistently one of the most timely national columnists you'll find in, in any newspaper. And the editors of the Journal Gazette really like him for that because if something happens today, he writes about it today, and we get it in tomorrow morning's paper. We really value that. And he writes it with authority and grace. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to welcome Eugene Robinson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor, and thank you especially, Tracy, who buys my column. 
which is, uh, <laughs> which is the ultimate kindness, and I so appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for having me here to this magnificent uh, facility. I kind of feel like uh, I should sing opera or something in here. It's beautiful. Uh, the acoustics are wonderful, and uh, uh, I won't do it justice, but I so appreciate being able to be here with you uh, this evening. I'll start with an old story. When, when I was a young journalist, which was a long, long, long time ago, I had a... Uh, a crusty old editor from Central Casting, and this was out in San Francisco. I was uh, what we used to call a cub reporter, and uh, I covered a shooting in Chinatown. I think six people, unfortunately, were killed, and so I came back and I wrote what the police told me. It was the deadliest shooting in Chinatown history, and the editor changed it to one of the deadliest shootings. And uh, so I argued, I said, the police said this, and he said, you'll be sorry, and I said, no, I insisted, I insisted. And sure enough, uh, we got, I think, five or six phone calls and letters the following day explaining that it wasn't actually the deadliest, and there were three or four incidents that had happened before that, that could be qualified as deadliest. So the lesson was, when possible, avoid superlatives. So <laughs> I've always tried to do that. However, you might have noticed I am no longer a young journalist. And uh, so I'm going to start tonight uh, by breaking that rule, and I'm just going to say flat out that this is the damnedest presidential election I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll bet it's the damnedest you've ever seen either. It is the, the most exciting, it's the most surprising, it is the most historic, and we haven't even voted yet. Uh, it's just amazing. You know, here we are in late October. Think back for a minute, just for a minute, think back to New Year's Day. On New Year's Day, if I had taken a poll of this audience, I think most people would have said that the general election contest was going to be between who and who? Between Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani. Okay, they are the two candidates who are leading in the polls and surely gonna run away with this whole thing. Well, that didn't quite happen. Um, on January 1st, we would have all said, you know, Barack Obama, you know, nice try, fine young man, maybe someday. We would have said John McCain is kind of sad, but he's become a complete non-factor. Joe Biden, just not gonna happen, okay? And I'm going to bet that there wouldn't be more than two or three people in this room, and probably not a whole lot south of Juno who knew that such a person <laughs> as Sarah Palin existed. <laughs> the moose population knew, but people didn't know. So I think that's an excellent example of exactly how far to trust the conventional wisdom. And uh, so my advice is whenever the conventional wisdom settles on a certain prediction or outcome, be very afraid and start looking for how it could turn out otherwise. The conventional wisdom is often wrong. So since then, we've had more twists and turns than a you know, bad spy novel. And you know, we, we think we maybe know who's going to win. We're not sure. Um, but one thing we do know is that the stakes in this election are incredibly high and uh, recently have gotten a lot higher. Uh, we already knew, we've known all year that at least, and this is my view, but I'm an opinion columnist, so I'll tell you my view. It is intolerable that there are 46 million Americans who have no health insurance. That is just intolerable. It is... It is uh, unconscionable that we are embroiled in, in two wars without really having a very good idea of what we're trying to do over there and when we're going to have it done. Uh, it is incredible. It is incredible that Americans, really for the first time, many Americans have a sense that their children's lives 
may not be as fulfilled and as uh, prosperous and as successful as their own lives. And that is just incredible to me, but it is the case in much of the country. And so all that was true all year, and then, of course, Wall Street melted down. And so in the past month, uh, as I said, the stakes in the election have gotten dramatically, dramatically higher. The last estimate I saw uh, from the Congressional Budget Office, and this was several weeks ago, so it has certainly climbed, but the last estimate I saw was that Americans thus far had lost something like $2 trillion in retirement savings. Uh, I, you know, I'm kind of afraid to like click on my 401k right now. I have a feeling that I'm in that figure, but uh, the two, I mean, just think of $2 trillion. This is an astounding amount of, of money. The Wall Street Journal reported recently that according to Moody's, something like 16% of mortgage holders, all mortgage holders in the United States, or about one out of six, owe more money than their house is worth, which is just incredible. That's 12 million households underwater. This is like the equivalent of a financial Hurricane Katrina, uh, you know, and except the flood is not receding. It gets deeper and deeper. And so this is not just a referendum on all the problems that we have, it has become a referendum in addition, in addition on Barack Obama and John McCain and on which one is better able to deal with an economic crisis that continues to threaten to spin just completely out of control. And I'll venture to say that nobody even seems to fully understand the dimensions of the crisis. Uh, at least neither presidential candidate really gives us confidence that they understand the, the dimensions of the crisis. Uh, let me say up front that I think this new electoral landscape, and I'm not talking about the red and blue map, I'm talking about the new issue landscape in which the economy is not just a top issue but a paramount issue, uh, that new landscape favors Barack Obama and the Democrats. Um, basically up and down the ticket. And it opens the possibility of not a democratic victory, but um, something approaching a democratic uh, tsunami uh, in, in, on November 4th. Now, I know that everybody in here has been paying attention. You've seen the polls, poll numbers shift. I mean, you've, you've paid attention to the fact that Indiana which has been a fairly reliable red state. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, okay? <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm under the impression that Indiana has voted for the Republican candidate in like every election in the last 40 years or something like that. Indiana's in play. You've seen actual presidential candidates come through here. They've asked for your vote. Uh, <laughs> they've tried to explain themselves to you. That, in and of itself, should tell you that things are happening. But, but when the economy becomes, became the big issue, you saw Obama's numbers start to tick up. And you saw the Republican tickets numbers start to tick down. Now, you'll remember that right after the Republican convention, and, and that too seems a long time ago, doesn't it? And you remember the Republican convention? We, uh, the, uh, the Democrats had just finished in Denver, and uh, Barack Obama gave that speech in front of 80,000 people. It was an amazing moment. The, the sound from the stadium echoed through the streets of the city. Uh, and the next morning, John McCain announced that Sarah Palin was going to be his vice presidential candidate. Now, I happened to be in Denver, and that morning I was doing uh, the Morning Joe show on MSNBC with Joe Scarborough on that Friday morning. Now, I am not Morning Gene. I am Evening Gene. Uh, so, <laughs> I was a little foggy that morning. I had been up late. I turned on the TV. I had heard somebody yammering at me about Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin. Uh, so I knew the name and I kind of knew who she was and I was kind of in the back of my mind saying, nah, 
but that's what I was hearing. So I dragged myself over to the downtown Denver diner where Morning Joe was being shot. And I'm kind of sleepily, I'm a little late, so I'm kind of walking past the booth on the way to, the, to where the cameras are in the back of the diner, and an arm reaches out from a booth and grabs me like this, and it's Pat Buchanan. And Pat has my arm in a death grip, and he's asking, what do, what do you hear? Is it that Palin woman? Is it Palin? And I kind of said, Pat, I, I think so. That's what everybody is saying. And he's like, oh, no, whoa, oh, oh, oh. whoa. I mean, literally holding his head uh, in despair. I get to the back of the diner. There's Mike Murphy, the Republican strategist, a couple of other re Republicans. And they're all going, oh, 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 oh. <clears throat> I look over there, next to them is Bill Burton, Barack Obama's uh, press spokesman, campaign press spokesman, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure she'll be a great candidate. <laughs> and so that was the initial reaction. And, uh, but we all go to Minneapolis. She gets up and gives that speech at the convention. I guess I'm not feeling it, but Pat Buchanan's in love. He <laughs> falls in love, and uh, uh, and uh, the the conservative right had found its uh, its champion, and it turned out to be Sarah Palin. They're very happy with each other. Um, <clears throat> so that's what everybody was talking about after the Republican convention. Everybody was talking about how Sarah Palin had saved John McCain's chances of winning the White House. He had erased Obama's lead. He had even pulled a little bit ahead. It seemed improbable in what ought to have been a democratic year, but it looked like John McCain could just pull this off and then the financial crisis hit. Or I suppose I should say it surfaced. I have a feeling it was down there, okay? I just don't think this happened all at once. I think bad things were happening all along. But First we had Lehman Brothers, then we had AIG. You know, Lehman Brothers goes out of business, AIG, all of a sudden we own the world's biggest insurance company. How did that happen? And then the Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, shows up uh, at Congress one Saturday morning with like the $700 billion ransom note. You know, <laughs> give me $700 billion. I'd hate to have anything bad happen to that nice economy of yours, you know. And, uh, and we went from there. And I don't think we fully appreciate just how scary this has been uh, and how close we came. I coming here, um, was passing through the airport in Detroit and was listening to CNN, and George Soros was being interviewed, the renowned financier. And Soros said uh, flat out, that he believes that when Lehman Brothers collapsed, it almost took the system with it, that that was the most perilous moment, that when, when the decision was made that Lehman Brothers wasn't too big to fail and that it could be allowed just to collapse and that the, that the, um, uh, that the system could somehow absorb it. And Soros was saying it almost couldn't. And it, you know, we almost kind of lost this whole construct there, but we didn't quite, and he thinks things are getting better, and that's some consolation, I suppose, to those of us who have lost what we laughingly refer to as our money <laughs> in the last few weeks. <clears throat> so the poll numbers in the presidential race started shifting um, pretty much immediately, and they've been moving pretty steadily ever since. Now you see a little blip up, a little blip back, but Right now, if you take an average, you'd have to say that Obama has something around a 6% lead, six point lead nationwide in the polls, which is an astoundingly big lead uh, this late in a presidential contest. That's, that's a pretty big lead. If he were to win by that much, you'd say it was a landslide. More significantly, he's also leading in the polls in many of the battleground states, three or four points in Ohio, 
three points in Florida, up to eight points in Virginia. My state, the Old Dominion, has not voted for a Democrat since 1964. And, you know, that was Lyndon Johnson. He spoke Southern, you know. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm confident that Virginia is, is, which has been trending toward the Democratic side in recent elections, I think it's going to go uh, four, six, eight points in Colorado, uh, the new bellwether, um, up to 10 points in Pennsylvania. Um, you don't have to believe it's 10 points to believe that that's probably out of reach for the McCain-Palin campaign. So it's a situation in which McCain essentially has to run the table of those battleground states uh, in order to put together an electoral majority. Now, the conventional wisdom says that the race is going to tighten, uh, and so maybe it will, um, and, and maybe it won't. Uh, the point is that R McCain has to make it tighten everywhere. Uh, in all the contested states in order to win. It's become a real uphill struggle for him with the wind in his face. So what happened? Well, it's obvious to me that John McCain really hurt himself with his kind of hot and cold reaction to the financial crisis. You know, the first reaction, fundamentals of the economy are strong. It kind of minimized the whole thing. Nothing to see here, folks, move along. In the process, he gave the Democrats an absolutely priceless soundbite, which they've been using about, you know, 57,000 times a day ever since. <laughs> then McCain quickly swung the other way, suspended his campaign, rushed back to Washington to handle the crisis and to save the day. Uh, it was supposed to look like bold leadership. It looked more to a lot of people like a lot of impulsive running around without much of a coherent purpose. That's what I think it looked like, and I think uh, it, it's hard to interpret the polls as uh, saying that other people got a different impression. Now, it's also of my opinion that Obama did not exactly cover himself with glory in the financial crisis either. He was steady and soothing, he wasn't in control of the crisis, he was in control of himself at least, but he didn't exactly offer new prescriptions. Uh, he didn't offer a new solution for getting us out of the crisis. There might not have been one to offer, but he, what he did was seem calm, seem in charge, seem reasonable, and that's something <laughs> oh, that's something. Confronted with something that none of us understand, I think a lot of people reacted to the fact that he seemed to confront that with a certain equanimity and purpose um, uh, and calmness. I think voters got those same two impressions of, a, of kind of frenetic activity and passion from McCain and kind of cool analytical um, uh, or cool analysis from Obama. I think voters got the same impression uh, in the presidential debates, in all three of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, if you watch the debates, uh, after all three debates, commentators, including on the network where I appear, immediately said, John McCain won. He was a winner. He took the fight to him and da 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 da. And they, they said that for about, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but that was said for the first half hour until the instant polls from CBS and CNN started coming in. And in every debate, they showed that by large majorities, the uncommitted voters who were polled saw Obama as the winner. And I'm convinced that the reason had more to do with body language, uh, demeanor, and the sense that they gave off rather than debating points. It wasn't about debating points. Both men are, are smart and well-informed and they know how to stay to their talking points. But John McCain, people said that's a little too much drama. And Obama, in the campaign, they call him No Drama Obama. And, uh, <laughs> 
and I think there's a feeling that, boy, we've had a lot of drama recently. Maybe we can get away from that. So <clears throat> at that point, the, um, the McCain campaign, um, which has gone back and forth on this, but the McCain campaign did make a decision, let's face it, to go negative. And so uh, Sarah Palin came out and, uh, well, all but called the guy a terrorist, right? I mean, she said, she said Obama's palling around with terrorists and talked about how uh, there are pro-America parts of the country, which implies that there are anti-America parts of the country. Uh, another uh, uh, Republican spokesman referred uh, just yesterday to uh, the real Virginia, which is not, I guess, not the part of Virginia that I live in, because the part of Virginia I live in is going to vote Democratic, so the real Virginia is going to vote Republican. Uh, you know, and the conventional wisdom is that negative campaigning works, and I think you could look at the poll numbers and you could argue that in the short term, when campaigns went negative, it did work, but that in the long term, it really didn't do a lot of good this year, or it hasn't done a lot of good this year so far. Uh, and maybe that's just because we have reached this crucial phase of the campaign at a time when people really are not in a mood to be distracted by lipstick on a pig. They're just not. They're not in a mood to uh, talk about uh, ancient history. Not when you know, what has happened to my retirement savings is, is an active question. What is gonna happen to my job is an active question. Uh, people are much more inclined to worry about those things, I think, uh, than social issues and historical uh, 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 battles uh, unresolved that are, uh, that in other campaigns uh, might occupy more mental space of the electorate. I don't think it's really what people want to talk about this time. So, you know, I'm going to be slightly unkind, and I should preface this by saying that I actually like John McCain. I, I vastly prefer the John McCain I knew before the campaign to the John McCain I know now, um, uh, because I knew John McCain as uh, a, a fair-minded, funny, smart, uh, 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 reasonable individual. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen, they've let that John McCain come out and play very much recently. But, you know, in the debates, if you just kind of unfocused your eyes and just kind of listened, voters kind of had a choice between, you know, the young Sidney Poitier and Don Rickles on a bad night, you know, and that's kind of what, I said I was gonna be unkind, but that's kind of what he looked like. And I don't, the, the first rule in politics when you're in a hole, you know, first thing to do is stop digging. I don't think McCain has stopped digging. He seems to want to, but he doesn't really stop digging. So I think the more he continues, with, I just don't think this um, Barack and Obama and the Democrats are all commie pinko socialists. I just don't think that's really going to be a productive line of argument for him this year. It might, it might be, but I don't think that's a good way to, for him to spend uh, the last weeks of the campaign. Um, so un unless I'm wrong, uh, Barack Obama is going to continue to lead this campaign. The Democrats are going to continue to look ahead toward larger and larger majorities in the House and the Senate. And um, the Republican Party is going to look forward to a kind of internecine battle royal over just what is the Republican Party anyhow. If you listen to Colin Powell's endorsement of Barack Obama on Meet the Press the other night, he said a whole lot less about Obama than he said about John McCain. He said, Obama, yeah, he's nice, he's good, he's smart, he's intelligent, you know, he can do the job. But he ran down John McCain and, and all the things uh, he has done that Powell thinks are beyond the pale, the, the William Ayers stuff, the, 
the, the, the equating the income tax with socialism, all the, all the kind of, frankly, far-right rhetoric that has found its way into the mouth of a man who was not known as a creature of the, particularly of the far-right. Uh, and I, I listened to that endorsement not just as kudos for, for, for Barack Obama, but also as kind of Powell's manifesto about ways in which the Republican Party has gone too far and how he'd like to see the party come out. And he's going to be a player in this, uh, perhaps a political player for the first time, though I don't think he's going to run for anything. Uh, Sarah Palin's going to be involved in, in deciding which way the Republican Party goes. Mitt Romney, Mike Huckabee. I, it's going to be very interesting to see what sort of new leadership and new ideas emerge from the Republican Party. Now, what can happen? Well, obviously things can happen. And I think there, there are basically three things that can um, make my predictions look silly. Number one, uh, there could be a serious misstep by Barack Obama. I don't think that's likely to happen. He's been on the campaign trail for how many years now? Uh, <laughs> he, uh, uh, if, if, and one thing you can say about him is that he is, he is cautious and tends to handle himself well in these situations. But of course, nobody's perfect. He could make a, a serious gaffe that could um, change a lot of minds, I suppose. Um, the other thing that can happen is an outside event. Uh, and, you know, heaven forbid, there could be uh, an act of terrorism. There could be, something could happen, an October surprise an early November surprise, whatever, that, uh, that somehow, at this point, fairly massively would have to uh, make voters uh, believe that A, national security was the paramount issue, and B, John McCain was more suited to, uh, to take on national security. And, of course, that could happen, um, but we hope it doesn't. Um, the other thing that could uh, make my predictions wrong is, is the issue of race. Uh, we have no data points on uh, uh, black candidates in presidential elections in this country. None. Now, um, but I think you've all probably heard of the so-called Bradley effect. Uh, just to summarize briefly, if you believe in the Bradley effect, it would essentially say that Barack Obama has to be way ahead in the polls right before election day in order to, to win. And, and that, in fact, is what happened to Tom Bradley, the late mayor of, uh, of uh, Los Angeles, was, the, uh, was running to become the first African-American governor of California. I think it was in 1982, uh, election eve, polls showed him winning comfortably uh, over his uh, white opponent, who was George Duke Majin. Uh, on election day, he lost. And then there were several subsequent high-profile campaigns involving black and white uh, candidates. Uh, Doug Wilder running to become the first black governor of Virginia, a contest that he won. Uh, David Dinkins running to become the first black mayor of New York City, a contest which he won. Uh, both those men won those contests very narrowly after being shown by the polls taken on the day before the election to be uh, substantially ahead. So what's going on? Well, the theory was that in the final hours, ostensibly undecided voters vo broke very massively for the white candidate. And why did they do that? Well, the but was the difference between the two, uh, you know, the question, uh, the assumption was uh, that it was because of race and that these undecided voters weren't really undecided, consciously or unconsciously, they just hadn't wanted to tell pollsters or whatever that, that they were going to vote against the black candidate. Well, <clears throat> so the obvious question for this year is whether the Bradley effect will have an impact on Obama's chances. and. You know, I have to apologize beforehand, but I've looked into this so much, 
you know, in journalism, we, we, we say that it is possible to over-research a story. I have over-researched the Bradley effect. And I've gotten to the point where I can convince myself of anything about the Bradley effect that I want to. I can believe whatever I want. I can believe it's alive and well, and I can you know, bring up the studies that show that it is. I can believe that it once was a huge factor and now has diminished to mere nothingness. Uh, I can even believe, if I choose, that it never really existed, that it was all kind of illusion, that it was a combination of other factors. Uh, you know, absentee votes and ballot initiatives and other things that caused Tom Bradley to lose that race. Uh, yet other factors that caused uh, Doug Wilder and David Dinkins' polling numbers to go down. Uh, and again, there just aren't enough data points about black candidates versus white candidates, even in statewide elections, to come to many conclusions. Uh, I do think it is fair to say, though, if you look at one recent fairly celebrated race, Harold Ford's race, uh, Senate race in Tennessee, I come to the conclusion that, yes, race was a factor in the, I don't know if you remember the ad, Harold Ford, an African-American candidate, and, and his white opponent ran an ad a few days before the election, with all these kind of glamorous people, um, you know, talking about Harold as kind of, it was like a precursor of the Paris Hilton ad uh, that McCain ran, except it ended with this blonde woman saying, call me Harold, call me, like that. And uh, uh, people saw a clear racial undertone in that ad, as did I, and I think it impacted the race, but that impact showed up in the polls. And, and Harold Ford's total, at the end of the day, was actually very close to what had been predicted by the final polls. So I don't know about the Bradley effect. I, my, my hunch, my gut, is that I do think race is a factor in the election. I think it is a factor that is mostly already taken into account. Mostly people um, who will not vote for Barack Obama because, because he's black are already, already saying they won't vote for him because he's black. Mostly people who will vote for Barack Obama because he's black are already saying they'll vote for him. So I think it's mostly already factored in. Uh, and I would be surprised if there were some huge uh, racial surprise on election day. And that's because it would be a surprise. So, uh, but I don't, I don't anticipate seeing more than a two or three point uh, Maybe, maybe two points, maybe one point, maybe no points. But I don't think there's going to be some big hidden racial effect on Election Day. I could be wrong. Uh, I think the most important number in this election, the most important single, single number has been the number 80, which has risen to about 85. That's the number of Americans, uh, the percentage of Americans who feel the country's on the wrong track. Uh, shown consistently in polls. It was 80%, 80%, 80% after, since the economic crisis has gone up to 85 or 86. This is a change year. This is a change election. Fundamentally, people are ready to turn the incumbent party out of the White House. Uh, and I gotta say this, uh, and it's hard for me to say, but I gotta say that Barack Obama thus is favored to win the presidency. Now, I just said that a black man <laughs> named Barack Hussein Obama is favored to become president of the United States. And I can't believe it. I can't believe I said it. Uh, so I'll tell another little story. I grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina in the late 1950s and early 1960s, which was the dying days of Jim Crow in the South. It was, uh, what was that time like? It, you know, separate schools, separate but unequal, schools, water fountains, playgrounds. Uh, we would, I remember we would drive to visit my father's mother, my grandmother who lived in Ann Arbor, and I was always very happy when we would get to Ohio. We'd stop at a playground uh, where my parents would turn me out of the car. I was kind of a hyperactive kid. They were, they were, they pretty much had it after being trapped in the car that long with me. And so they'd stop at a playground, and I, I have a vivid memory of being able to use the big sliding board because there was a big sliding board in Orangeburg, but it was at the white playground. I couldn't use it. 
and uh, I could never go there. And so I could go to this, this playground in Ohio. I could use the, the big sliding board. Um, you know, in, I have vivid memories of the day in 19, uh, eight, 1968 when I was in high school. Uh, some students at South Carolina State University, a historically black college in Orangeburg, the town where I grew up, uh, decided to protest a segregated bowling alley downtown in Orangeburg. The protest kind of escalated into a more general protest. It ended up lasting three days. Uh, at the, uh, on, the, on the second morning of the protest, I remember waking up, of course school was, you know, was canceled uh, because um, the, the, the natives were restless. And uh, so I remember waking up and going to the window to look out to see what was happening because South Carolina State is only about three, 400 yards from my house and you could kind of see the protests the night before. And I went to the front window in the bedroom and, and I heard from behind my father yelling at me at a voice that, a tone of voice I'd never heard from him. He was the gentlest man in the world. He was like, get down, get down, get down now. And so I, you know, I got down out of the window and he let me peek out and across the street on a kind of empty area, there were 12 South Carolina Highway Patrol cars. Uh, officers out of the cars, doors open, officers behind the doors, rifles trained at a house two doors down from mine. They thought they had cornered the, quote, outside agitator, end quote, who was, who was stirring up all this trouble. Uh, turned out to be a man named Cleveland Sellers, who was from uh, Denmark, South Carolina, about 14 miles down the road. And he was long gone, fortunately, so there wasn't any gunplay that morning. Uh, but there was gunplay that night. Uh, three unarmed students were killed by highway patrol, patrolmen, shot in the back and the soles of their feet, uh, never found to have any weapons. There was a trial, it was, there was an acquittal, it never led to anything. The only person who ever got convicted of anything was Cleveland Sellers, uh, who, had, who yes, had organized the protest. And he got convicted and later pardoned. So why do I tell you that whole story? Well, my father, Harold Robinson is now 92 years old. Just saw him a week and a half ago. Uh, he's ailing, but he's hanging in there. And he and my mother, who's 86, still live in that same house. And the fact that they have lived, after all they've seen, my father's born in 1916, and the fact that they have lived to see a time when a black man can run as the nominee of the Democratic Party for president of the United States and maybe win, that's, that's amazing to me. And uh, uh, so this has been a history making year already. We won't know for another couple of, couple of weeks how much more history we'll make. I guess we'll make history either way. Uh, but uh, as I said, to begin, it is the damnedest pre presidential election I've ever seen. And uh, put on your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride to the finish. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to have some question and answer time. So uh, microphones are going to be coming around. If you have a question for uh, Mr. Robinson, please raise your hand. Uh, my, my question is, I am one of those independents, but I've decided who I'm going to vote for. My concern is that both parties seem to be ruled oftentimes by the right or the left wing. What are the chances are, and we've, and we've seen what's happened the last eight years, 
especially six of the last eight years, with the right wing controlling. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think will happen? Will, wh whoever wins the election, will they be able to bring it back to the center and get something done, which is what I want done? Um, you know, I'm actually optimistic on that score. Basically, that old thing about necessity being the mother of invention, I, I don't think the next president is going to have a choice, frankly. Uh, this economic situation uh, is serious enough that, you know, what's the one question that neither candidate would honestly answer in the debate? The question was, given the economic crisis, which of your promises are you going to defer? What are you not going to do that you promised to do? Neither one would answer that question. Well, guess what? One of them becomes president, and not answering that question is not an option. And I think in their way, in, in different ways, McCain and Obama are both almost uniquely uh, uh, qualified and determined uh, to, to, to kind of go beyond uh, the traditional partisan gridlock. I think they go about it in very different ways. They think about it in very different ways. McCain, despite the fact that he has, you know, campaigned like a troglodyte and, uh, uh, you know, basically, um, everything we know about him uh, indicates that you know, yes, he will reach across the aisle to Democrats to f try to form centrist coalitions in the Congress for compromise legislation. That's kind of his, his MO. And he has done it in the past. There's no reason to think that he wouldn't do it. Well, besides Sarah Palin, there's no reason to think that he wouldn't do it in the future. Let me amend that, right? <laughs> that could be an asterisk. Um, but. Obama is, is different and, and, in a sense, much more ambitious. Um, with greater ambition comes greater risk, in, in a sense. I think he sees the solutions as being post-partisan and not bipartisan, in the sense that he, you know, he, he has lectured me several times about, about what he sees as false choices. And, um, and he sees this, you know, our traditional way of, you know, this is left and this is right, as boxing us into uh, ways of looking at things that have uh, constrained us since the Vietnam era. And so uh, he sees no contradiction in saying, in, in talking about personal responsibility and also about collective responsibility and about. Um, uh, and in having very liberal views on some things and, and, and fiscally conservative views on the other hand, he would say there's no contradiction there and that there's a way to build a more general popular consensus for policies that he would see as reasonable and necessary and then to work from that back toward the Congress, which would then, despite its whatever its tendencies to wrangle on partisan lines, would have to listen to the people who sent him there. I think that's kind of his approach. But, you know, in general, if, if your choice is between Obama and the old John McCain, at least, um, we could have done a lot worse in terms of having a choice of candidates who would try to get beyond partisan wrangling. People, people say, you know, Obama's so liberal and this and that. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, I mean, I know him a little bit. I, I don't think of him as all that liberal, to tell you the truth. On, and on many issues, I think of him as, as, uh, as well to the right of the party. But. Uh, why, why hasn't Bill Clinton been more visible in the Obama campaign? And go blue. <laughs> go blue. Go blue. Where are we supposed to go? Uh, <laughs> We've been going, but we've been going really fast in the wrong direction. And uh, I, um, but uh, anyhow, in spirit, go blue. Um, Bill Clinton has been, why hasn't he been more visible? 
frankly, I think that for a long time, uh, there was a chill between Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. I don't think they are perhaps ever going to be uh, really bosom buddies. Um, but, and if you want to attribute that to something, um, I always thought that what Bill Clinton really was angry about was when Obama s said if he were elected, he wanted to try to be a transformational president like Ronald Reagan and, uh, and, and not like Bill Clinton, whom he just kind of, you know, by implication left to the side as kind of a much less transformational president. And, and I, I, oh, well, that just seemed to really annoy Bill Clinton, who is proud of his record in office, in his years in office. Um, I won't comment further on some of what happened in office, but it, <laughs> um, but um, I, you know, is it a, com yeah, a, a sort of competition between two alpha males? I don't know. It could, it, it kind of could be, but um, recently, in the last couple of weeks, there's been, if not warmth, then at least more collaboration between the two. And Bill Clinton has been going out uh, to places where those white working class voters are, trying to uh, get them for, uh, for, for uh, Barack Obama. Do you want to take one more? In terms of foreign relations mm -hmm. and, and foreign um, policy, which candidate do you think would be more um, warmly welcomed by the outer world, particularly with the ways that the candidates in their rallies in some places have been demonizing the Arabs and Muslims, you know, when it's mm -hmm. totally equated yeah. with terrorism. So I was just wondering um, what your thoughts were on that. Well, I, uh, there are actually are some polls that indicate, international polls that show if, if the world were voting, Obama would be president. The world's not voting, and that's probably a good thing. So, you know, we get to vote. Um, but, uh, uh, no, I mean, there, there's a lot of curiosity about Obama, who talks about uh, America's place in the world and America's relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, uh, I actually believe, so I believe that at least initially there would be, plus he would be a different face for this country. Uh, and people react to something that's different, they pay attention. It would be the first time you saw you know, a brown face instead of um, uh, you know, representing the country. So that would, be, that would be different and I think people would to a certain extent to respond to that. Uh, but I don't think we should be naive about uh, the fact that in the end of the day, Obama's if he's a good president, gonna be pursuing US interests, which is not always gonna be popular overseas. At the end of the day, John McCain, despite some of the rhetoric at some of the rallies, uh, is an internationalist at heart who is, is known, particularly in Europe, who is not thought of uh, uh, the way um, uh, some people think of George Bush around the world. Uh, uh, and so I think there would be differences in their foreign policy. I'm not sure that, you know, they would be all that great. It might be more, you know, atmospherics, as you said, who would be welcomed more. Obama would be welcomed more. Would they do different things their first year? Obama would maybe set a deadline instead of a timeline for getting out of Iraq. <laughs> you know, Obama would, wants to put more troops in Afghanistan quicker than McCain seems to do, but necessity might compel him to do that anyhow. So, thank you all very much. Thank you for your questions.